Hey guys, welcome back to the Compass Games Learn to Play series. Today we welcome first time designer Steve Liskey, and he's going to be teaching us how to play his first game, Second Fallujah, Iraq, November, December 2004, which is in Paper Wars issue 103. So let's get started. Over to you, Steve. Hi, everyone. My name is Steve Liskey, and I'm going to show you the game Second Fallujah, which is going to be coming out in Paper Wars number 103. And it covers, as you would guess, the Second Battle of Fallujah, which took place in Iraq in November and December of 2004. So the game is an area movement game. And as you can see, looking at the map, the city is divided into a number of areas, 51 areas. These areas regulate movement and control and combat. So first of all, as you look at the map, let's try and understand the map. In the 51 areas, each area has a unique symbol. And over here, you'll see the symbols that show up on the map. It'll be one of three. There will either be a green square, which indicates the area has a mosque. There'll be an orange triangle, which indicates that it's a victory point area, or there'll be a white circle, which indicates there's no special terrain in the area. Each one of those symbols will have two numbers inside of them. The top number is just a numbering of the area. It's an area ID. It allows you to uniquely identify an area. The second number is the terrain effect modifier and the TEM. We war gamers love our acronyms. And that describes how dense the urban terrain is and has an effect on combat. That will use B for each area. In addition, as you look at the areas, there's a control marker in each one. All of the areas, this is the starting position for the game. All of the areas start with the insurgents in control of the entire map, and it's indicated by a black square with a yellow dot. This is a flag that was used by some of the insurgent groups at this time. It can flip over if the coalition takes control. It shows, as you can see in area 27 in the center of the map, to a green field with a white star, that would indicate coalition control. Okay, besides the areas, if you look around the map, at the top of the map, there are two entry zones. These are where the coalition forces enter the game. In fact, the starting position for them is shown with the various units arrayed in the two entry zones. As you go around the rest of the map, there's a red line that shows the border of the playable area. And over on the right side, there's a couple of tracks that help you keep track of various game functions. There's a game turn marker. There are seven turns in the game. Each one represents one day. The fighting in Fallujah actually was about six weeks from early November until about the middle of December, but the key portion was the first week. So that's what's represented in the game with seven turns. There's also an impulse track. This is an area impulse game. You may be familiar with other area impulse games like Turning Point Stalingrad or Breakout Normandy, Avalon Hill Classics, or other games. What the impulse track does is it lets you break down a turn into a number of mini turns. So as opposed to some more games where one side moves all their units and does all their combats, and then the other side moves all their units and does all their combats. In this game, each turn takes a mini turn, an impulse where they activate an area or take some other action, move and fight with those units, and then their opponent gets a chance to activate an area, move and fight with some units. And as they do that, the units are spent and can no longer do further actions in that turn. There's also a track that indicates political backlash. The coalition had multiple goals in the Battle of Fallujah. Fallujah was controlled by insurgents and was spreading conflict throughout Anwar province and Baghdad and other parts of Iraq. They wanted to take the city, so some Victory points are awarded for control of various areas in the city. They wanted to eliminate important insurgent units. They also wanted to avoid casualties because the U.S. was politically sensitive to it. They also wanted to avoid political faux pas that would turn people in Iraq against the coalition and the current Iraq government. Particularly, these are associated with the mosque areas where you want to make sure you avoid bombing mosques or whatever it may be. Very often the mosques were centers of the insurgency. The imams were leaders 
or weapons and supplies were cached there. They had to be very careful in approaching it to avoid bad media visibility. And in that regard, usually Iraqi units need to be included in any operations in areas that that show mosques. And many of them were important in the battle. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the units that are in the game. If you look on your left, you'll see an illustration that shows the basic units. For the coalition, there are combat units. They use pretty standard NATO symbology war game symbols that show unit ID, type of unit. They have two numbers. The first represents combat factor, combat strength. The second is the movement factor. After a unit has performed an action, it flips over to its spent side, and then it can no longer perform actions in that turn other than just defending itself. Since it can't move or fight, it only has a single number, which indicates its combat factor. That combat factor is usually less because one aspect that's represented here is that often after moving into a new position or being in an engagement, that is when a unit is at its weakest. It has to resupply, troops may be tired, fields of fire aren't set up, aren't dug in. So units are at their weakest after they've performed an action, and that's represented by the lower combat factor on the spent side. And that's basically when they're ripe for counterattacks from the insurgent player. The only difference among combat units is sometimes a combat unit will have its combat factor in parentheses. That indicates that it cannot lead an attack. So anytime you have an attack for the coalition, you have to have at least one unit that has a, a combat factor that's not in parentheses. Okay, second type of unit, support units. There were a number of supporting units that were attached in the Battle of Fallujah, armor units, heavy weapons units, anti-tank weapon units, and these do not have a combat factor, and instead they provide a modifier in combat when they are paired with a combat unit. So the support units are slightly different in that instead of a combat factor, they show a modifier, and you can tell that by the plus indicated on the unit shown on the side there, and offensive value would be what the OV stands for, and the movement factor is as normal. The other thing you can see with the coalition units is they actually come in three flavors. You'll notice there are TAN units. These are U.S. Marine units. There are green units, those are U.S. Army units, and there are blue units, those are Iraqi units. So those are the coalition units. Now, if you look at the insurgent units, there are three types. There are Fedayeen. These are core fighters, usually trained. The units are about company-sized uh, groups of, of hardcore fighters. There are cadres. These are the leadership elements for the insurgency. and they have an important role in that they can help to organize the militia units. And then there are militia units. The militia units are very weak, but they are plentiful. And they're a little bit different in that they're not actually deployed at the beginning of the game, but rather are created as the game proceeds by the cadre units and deployed onto the map. Okay, again, this shows the setup to the game. Just a real quick note on the setup, it shows the coalition units in their proper entry zones. The cadre units are deployed one per area with a mosque and to a few critical areas like the old, the Jolan district of the old city up in the northwest corner. Besides that, there are 20 Fedayeen units. There's a button up here on the very top, the insurgent setup card. That pops a little card up for you. And there are 20 units, and this is just an aid. There is free setup for these units. The only restriction being that you can only place two per area. So for example, I can go ahead and place some of these on the map. And again, it's free setup. And this just helps you a little bit to keep track of how many units you have and how many you're allowed to deploy. Militia placement occurs a little differently. Again, that only happens during the game when militia units are deployed by the cadre units. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the sequence of play. So up here you can see the sequence of play. There's four basic phases to the game. The action phase is the heart of the game. This is where the impulses occur, and so 90% of the game is in the action phase. And for each impulse. It starts with the insurgent player taking their impulse. Then the coalition player 
takes their impulse. And then as part of that impulse, there will be a dice roll that determines whether the game continues to another impulse or whether a turn ends. And this represents the fact that for all the great plans that you have in military operations, you can never be sure exactly how much gets accomplished. So the end of the game turn is actually variable, determined by the dice roll. And this creates a lot of tension for both sides. The coalition player is always going to want to do more than they're going to have time to do, and they have to carefully prioritize what they do. The insurgent player is always going to feel like they're hanging on by their fingernails, and they want the turn to end so they can reposition and regroup, but they don't know how long they have to hold out. So it creates a lot of tension for both sides. When the action phase ends, there's a regroup phase. This allows both sides, first the insurgent player, then the coalition player, to do a little bit of repositioning of their forces in preparation for the next turn. Then there's an infiltration phase. As the coalition moves into the city, they have to be very careful as they clear areas out and gain control that they don't let insurgents back in. And this did happen historically. So the way this works is in the infiltration phase, you go and make a quick test of every area that is coalition controlled. If it is adjacent to an insurgent controlled area, it has to be garrisoned. Otherwise, it flips. And in fact, that can even daisy chain because once that flips, it may be next to another area. So the coalition player does need to give some thought to how they maintain security along their front line, if you want to call that, to make sure that insurgents don't reoccupy areas that were previously cleared. As I said, historically, that did happen where once or twice in the battle, areas were cleared. The next morning, the coalition forces woke up and they were taking fire from behind them, areas they had just cleared before. That's the infiltration phase. Finally, the reset phase is just housekeeping. Tracks, turn markers are advanced. Spent units all flip back to fresh in preparation for the next turn. Okay, let's talk about a few of the uh, mechanics of what happens in an impulse. Okay, and so what we'll show is here, in an impulse, what happens? In an insurgent impulse, the insurgent has three choices. They can activate an area. If they activate an area, any fresh units in that area can move, they can fight, or they can do both. And after they do that, then they're spent and can't do another action in that turn. Another option they have is what's called organized resistance. Let's pick an area, say up here in the very top right corner, area 18. Notice there's a cadre unit. If I select area 18 for an organized resistance, I can place one fresh militia unit in that area. And that's per cadre. So if I had two cadres there, I could place two militia units. If I had three, I could place three militia units as long as I stay within stacking limits. So this is one of the mechanisms whereby militia units appear on the map. Okay, so besides activating an area, besides organizing resistance, the uh, insurgent can pass. Sometimes you just like your defensive setup and you just want to sit and wait until you see what the other player does. Coalition impulse. They have three choices. Similar to the insurgents, they can activate an area. If they activate an area, any fresh units in that area can move, can fight, or do both. Any units in an area that are activated that don't do an action stay fresh, but units that do any action, move or fight, they're flipped to spent. Alternatively, they can activate an entry zone, which works almost the same way. You can activate either the northeast or the northwest entry zone up in the corner, and you can move up to eight units into an area and then do combat as well. Another option that the coalition has is a fire mission. And the fire mission basically represents artillery or airstrikes. Instead of moving and fighting with combat units, there's a marker, if you notice, way off on the right side, a fire mission marker. Again, I'll use Area 18 as an example. I can move that marker there and say, I'm going to do a fire mission there. I can choose any area that has coalition units in it or adjacent to it. And that just lets me do an attack with a fixed combat value representing an artillery or airstrike. The coalition player can do this as many times as they want. The only price is an opportunity cost because it uses the entire impulse. And so every time you do a fire mission, it takes away an opportunity for you to do something with your maneuver units. So those are the, the basic phases. Now, 
talk about a few of the other mechanics that occur. First of all is stacking limit. Stacking limit for areas are eight units of each side. There can be up to eight units from each side, and that is instantaneous, unlike some other war games. So it is possible to get a traffic jam, and it occurs especially for the coalition forces. If you have eight units in an area, you cannot place more units there. You cannot move through that's important. Now, when you do movement, you can move individually or as a stack. So sometimes it's important to move individually. You may have seven units in an area. You can move through one at a time, but you can't move through as a stack. So the stacking limit is instantaneous. Let's take a little look at movement costs. In an area impulse game, typically the movement points are used both for movement and for combat. They're not separate. So terrain has absolutely no effect on movement. All spaces are the same as far as movement points are considered. The movement point cost varies depending on enemy control, the presence or absence of enemy units. So for example, it's one movement point if you are entering an area you control that have no enemy units. It's two movement points if you want to enter an enemy control area that's empty. It's three or four depending on if there are enemy units there that may be fresh or spent. Similarly, if you start out in a contested area, it costs you movement points to fight a combat in that area, and that depends on whether they're fresh or spent, how many movement points that costs. There's a number of fine points to movement. Probably the major thing is an obvious one. Whenever you move into an area that has an enemy unit, the first time you move in, you are required to attack. It's called a mandatory attack. If it's a contested area at the beginning of the impulse, you can move additional units in without attacking. But the first time you move into an area with enemy units in it, you must attack. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how do you resolve combat? The basic part of combat is pretty straightforward. You look at the combat strength of the lead attacking unit. You look at the combat factor of the defending unit, and you then add a bunch of modifiers to them. And then you roll two dice, add the totals, and compare them. Whoever has the highest total wins the combat. How many casualties you take is a function of the difference between the dice rolls. Now, for coalition combat, the coalition forces were these combined arms. And so the more supporting arms you can get involved in a combat, the more power you have in your attack. So I'm showing here a list that shows for the coalition offensive value, there's a whole bunch of modifiers you can add. So for example, you may attack with a unit that has a combat factor of six, but as you put more and more support units, you may get additional modifiers. If you have additional infantry units, if you have weapons units, if you have armor or cavalry units, you have engineer, Iraqi, special forces, all of those add to your combat factor, your offensive value as it's called. And you can also get modifiers for battalion integrity. There are four Marine battalions that were the core of the coalition force. And if you look in the entry zones, you'll see that uh, they're included together. And in fact, they're color coded. So they all four companies of a Marine battalion have their unit marked with the same color so that it's easy to identify which units form a battalion. And if you use all four of them together, you do get a bonus in combat. There's some negative modifiers. If there are army and marine units in the same combat, there's a minus one. And there's also a minus if there's an ambush, which we'll talk about in a minute. The insurgent defensive value is pretty simple and straightforward. It's the combat factor of the defending unit. You add the terrain of the area. So a dense area may be four added to the open area, may be zero. That's added to the defensive value. One other possible modifier comes from the fact that a unit can be dug in. Let's look again at area 18 up in the top right-hand corner. There's a FEDAIN unit there. It, it can be marked with a dug-in marker. This gives it a bonus in combat, but it reduces its ability to move. It cannot move. It cannot retreat. So it gives it an advantage in combat, but it means that it can't move, it can't retreat, it is going to be there. The only way it'll go away is if it's eliminated. In other words, this is the ditch they've chosen to die in. So that would be the only other modifier. Flipping it, the, the battle was very asymmetrical. So if you have an insurgent attack, the number of modifiers is greatly reduced. But 
the terrain actually works the opposite direction. So when the coalition is attacking, the more dense the urban terrain is, the more advantage accrues to the defender. It's the opposite when the insurgents are attacking because of the overwhelming coalition firepower, open areas, the insurgents actually get negative modifiers, whereas in a dense urban area where they can close, they actually get a positive modifier. The last thing I'll talk about is casualty points with regard, with, last thing with regards to combat. When the dice are rolled and you get a total, say one player has a total of 12, the other one has a player total of seven, that's five casualty points. The way the insurgents take casualty points is by either they can flip a fresh unit to spent, that's a casualty point. They can retreat a spent unit, that's a casualty point, or they can eliminate a unit. So a fresh cadre or fedayeen unit it has as many as three casualty points if it's eliminated. A militia unit being very weak is a single casualty point that eliminates it automatically. For the coalition, if they take casualty points, it works a little differently on an attack. It's two casualty points if you lose, one if it's a draw. When they are attacked, it's two casualty points if it's a US unit that's attacked, one casualty point if it's an Iraqi. And the casualty points work a little bit differently for the coalition because during the time of the battle, there really wasn't an impact on the combat power of the units from the casualties that they took. So there's no retreating or reduction in strength or elimination of coalition units. Any casualties that are suffered are only marked on the political backlash track and represent victory points for the insurgents. And there is also a modifier for that. If you look up in the top right hand corner, you'll see that one of the units that's there is an armored medevac and it's marked minus one CP. So anytime an armored medevac participates in a combat, it reduces any casualty points suffered by the coalition. The last thing I'll mention is control. As I said, all of the control at the beginning of the game is by the insurgents. Anytime there is an area has only units of the other side, it flips instantly with one exception, and that's what we'll call insurgent reaction. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go to some examples of play and I'll do it this way. So it's a little bit easier to, to see the blown up view. And so we'll walk through and show how some of these actually work in action and give you a feel for how this plays. These are illustrated examples of play that are actually written up and will be on the Compass website on the product pages of download. So you can access them independently, look through them. Maybe you have them in front of you now. Okay, let's assume this could very easily be the first impulse of the game. Let's assume that it's a coalition impulse and we're blowing up the top right hand corner, the northeast portion of the map. The coalition player may decide that she's going to activate an entry area. That's the action she's taking. So she activates the Northeast Entry Zone that has, let's say, these units in it. She will choose to take a single Marine Infantry Company and move into Area 18. Okay, now, and this is probably the main mechanic that distinguishes this from other war games, the Insurgents have the chance to react to that. In this battle, the insurgents really control when and where they fight. They can choose to stand and fight, or they can choose to run away. They are not forced to fight in this environment. So after moving the first infantry company in, we'll pause and there is insurgent reaction. Now here are the choices that insurgent reaction allows. First of all, the insurgent can run away. Any Fedayeen or Cadre unit in the area can flip to spent and move to a friendly area. They do not have to fight. That's one option they have. And that's on an individual unit basis. Alternatively, they can do nothing or they can reinforce. So if it's a Fedayeen unit, it can choose to place a dug-in marker as its reaction. If it's a cadre unit, it can choose to place a militia unit as its reaction as to reinforce the battle that's going to be coming because a mandatory attack is required. Any fresh cadre unit in an adjacent area can also react. They can either place 
a militia unit in the area that was just entered or in their own area, usually that's done in preparation for a counterattack that can occur after the battle is over and the coalition units are spent. So let's see how the insurgent player chooses to react. Okay, first of all, her Fedayeen unit, she's going to say, I don't want to run away, but I'm not going to dig in because I may want to retreat from the combat. So I'm not going to do anything. The cadre unit that's in Area 18 will choose to place a militia unit. So they're reinforcing. The cadre unit that's in 19 also gets to react. It could place either in its own area or in Area 18. It's going to choose to reinforce the combat as well. So it's going to place in Area 18. And that's the reaction. Now the coalition unit can continue their impulse. And she's going to say, okay, it looks like the insurgents looking for a fight. So she's going to move all the rest of these units. She moves the rest of the Marine battalion in. She moves in a supporting armor unit. She moves in an MP unit. This doesn't actually have any effect on the battle, but the coalition player is thinking ahead and thinking that at a later date, I may move the rest of the battle group on. I will want to have a unit there to garrison and the MP is well suited for that. Also, this is a mosque area. So if we attack without an Iraqi unit present, that'll be a political point, a victory point penalty. So one of the an Iraqi infantry battalion is going to accompany. It's not a modifier, but it prevents a political penalty. So if you do the arithmetic, you add up, you see that uh, you look for the offense. The coalition player has six for a combat factor of the lead unit. They have a number of other modifiers for the support units and for battalion integrity. They come up with an offensive value of 12. Okay, looking at the insurgent player, it's just the lead unit is a three. The terrain value is two, so it's a five. So the coalition is a Players is attacking at a significant advantage. So they both roll their dice. Let's say they both get a seven. The offensive total for the coalition is 19. For the insurgent is 12. The difference is seven. The insurgent player has lost the battle. They have to take seven casualty points. Well, the lead unit has to take at least one. So the insurgent player is just going to go ahead and he's going to eliminate the FedAin unit. That's three. He's going to eliminate one of the militia units. That's a fourth, only one for militia units. He's going to eliminate the other militia unit. That's five. Now the cadre unit, which is the most valuable, can flip to spent. That's a sixth. And then retreat. That's a seventh. So it moves to area 20, but it survives because the insurgent has satisfied the seven casualty points that were required. Given that, see the end result of the battle is... The battle is over, all of the coalition units flip to spent, and since there are no insurgent units anymore, it flips to coalition control. That's the end of the impulse. Now, what would have happened is the way the end of the turn is determined is you look at the first coalition combat roll. And so it was a seven. That means if it was impulse zero through seven, there would be another turn. But if the roll was less than the impulse number, like it was impulse number eight or nine or 10, that would mark the end of the turn and you'd go to the regroup phase. Okay, so that would be an example of a fairly simple impulse with movement, reaction, and combat. Okay, let's take a look at a little bit more complex example, and this will show some other features of the game, overrun and ambush. So let's say it's the next turn. And if you look at what we have up here, it shows the same area of the map, the same units, but it's the next turn. So all of the units that were spent have now flipped to fresh. So we'll assume that it's a coalition impulse and the coalition player is gonna activate area 18 for movement and combat. Okay, instead of being tentative like last time, They want to move into area 19, and so she's just going to do it. She takes all of the units that are there, the Marine Battalion, the Armored Unit, the Iraq Unit, they all move into area 19. Notice that the MP unit stays behind, and that's to garrison the space so it doesn't flip in the infiltration phase. And since it doesn't do anything in this impulse, it's just going to stay fresh. The other units move in, and we're going to have insurgent reaction because there's a cadre in Area 19, and there's a cadre unit in adjacent Area in 24. So let's see what we'll pause and let the insurgent player make their reaction. 
And first of all, the cadre that's in Area 19, it sees a very powerful force. It's all by itself. This is not a battle it wants to fight. It's going to run away. So it flips to spent, and it can move to Area 24, which is a friendly area. The cadre in 24 can place a militia either in its own area or in Area 19. It places it in 19. So now we have a mandatory attack required because there's an insurgent unit there and the coalition just entered the area. So let's see how that goes. It's a pretty one-sided battle. If you go through the calculations, you start with a combat factor for the lead unit of six. And when you add in all of the modifiers, you get an offensive value of 12. The insurgent player has a zero for a combat factor and only the two for defense. It's only a two defensive value. So the difference is 10. Now, when you have a situation where you have only militia units defending and the difference between the offensive and defensive values is five or more, it's considered an automatic victory for the coalition. And in fact, it's an overrun so that the units can continue to move an attack with whatever movement points they have remaining. Now, this is where it's maybe you could, we can look at a, a fine point and say when the insurgent player reacted, they had a choice of placing the militia either in area 19 or in its own area 24. Placed in 19, and you might say, well, that that it had no chance of winning that battle, but it was still a significant thing to do because... If it had placed in 24, the units moving into area 19, that would have been a vacant enemy controlled area. That's only two movement points. They would have had, the Marine units had five, the uh, Iraqi unit had four. They would have had enough movement points to continue into area 24 and attack there. However, what the insurgent player did by placing a militia unit there, now it's an area with a fresh enemy combat unit, that's four movement points. So that means after the combat, which the insurgent has no chance of winning, it's an overrun. The units can continue moving, but they only have three movement points. They do not have enough movement points to move into area 24 and attack because it requires four with a fresh combat unit. So the militia unit, although it didn't last very long, served an important function. Now, once it's gone, the area flips to coalition control. Since it was an overrun, and I should mention the other way an overrun can occur is if you have a battle and the insurgent cannot satisfy the casualty points, that's also considered an overrun and the coalition can continue moving and fighting. So let's look and see what the coalition player decides to do. And she's gonna take one of the infantry companies and move into area 23. That is a vacant enemy controlled area, it takes two movement points. It has three left over after the first area, so it has enough to move in, but has to pause at this point because there's a cadre unit in an adjacent area, the insurgent can react. So let's see what the insurgent player does for his reaction. And he's gonna place a fresh militia unit in area 23. Okay, this creates an interesting situation because Entering an area with a fresh enemy combat unit requires four movement points. The Marine unit that moved in only had three. By placing a fresh unit there, it changed the number of movement points that are required. The way we account for that in the game is we call this an ambush. And so when we do the combat, the movement point that it didn't have, the minus one that it was missing, counts as a negative modifier in the combat as an ambush. And it could be one or it could be two, depending on the situation. Okay, so now after reaction, we're going to let the coalition player finish her move. We'll take a look and see what she does. And she's going to say, well, since I have an ambush now and I'm going to have a minus one modifier, I'm going to reinforce that combat. So she moves the weapons company and that provides a plus one that's going to match that so she's more confident of winning that battle okay if we take a look at the combat it's pretty straightforward the offensive value there's six for the combat factor plus one for the weapons company minus one for the ambush so it's just a six the defensive value it's a zero unit plus two for the tem so the defensive value is two 
So the coalition player rolls two dice. In this example, we say she gets a five, five and six. Her total is 11. The insurgent player rolls and gets an eight. Eight and two is 10. Wow, that was close. But the coalition player wins the battle just barely. One casualty point is required. Since a militia, eliminating a militia is only a single casualty point, the unit is eliminated. But since it satisfied that, that's the end of the impulse for those units, they'll have to flip to spent. And now since the insurgent unit is gone, it flips to coalition control. But remember, there were still units in area 19 that had movement points left. So the coalition player can continue that impulse. And we're going to say what she decides to do. We won't follow all the way through this because I think you've got the idea of what we're doing here. But she's going to say, okay, I'll take a couple of those units and I'll, they are going to move down into an adjacent area. Because we want to garrison it, we're going to leave one unit behind. Since it's already moved and fought, if it's not doing anything more, it has to flip to spent because it's done for this impulse and for this turn. Okay, and that's the way this example would work. So here I'm going to switch. We'll do one more example. And what I would like to do is walk through an example of an insurgent attack because there's some significant differences between combat when the insurgents are attacking versus when the coalition is attacking. Okay, so now I've put up the third example and we can see a portion of the map blown up from the west side of the map near the river. This say is in the middle of a turn and we can see that there's already some units that have taken actions and are spent. So let's say that it's the insurgent player's impulse and he looks and says, I have quite a few units in area 45, I'm gonna activate it and I'm gonna move and attack with those units. Now, the difference with the insurgent compared to the coalition, the coalition tended to make coordinated combined arms attacks. So in a coalition attack, all the units move, combat is conducted, and only one combat is conducted in, a, in an area in a given impulse. With the insurgent, it's the opposite. All of the attacks are totally uncoordinated. So any insurgent attack is a single unit only. But you can have as many combats in an area as you wish, as many as you have units that you can activate. And these attacks do not need to be pre-designated. If you look in the rules, you'll see that the modifiers when insurgents attack are considerably fewer. For the attacker, it's basically just the terrain of the space you're attacking into and maybe a modifier if it's a FEDAIN. For the defender, it's only the combat factor of the defending unit. So here, let's see what the insurgent player is going to try and do. Okay, he's going to activate one of the militia units and move into area 44. Because it's a TEM of four, he's going to get an advantage because it's dense urban terrain. Now, just as a note, we'll say here, you might look and say, well, area 47 has a weaker unit, but area 47 has a fresh unit. To move into an area with a fresh enemy combat unit requires four movement points. If you look around the map, you'll notice there are no insurgent units with four movement factor. They only have three. So they cannot actually move in and attack an area with a fresh coalition combat unit. Spent units, yes. Support units, yes. Fresh combat unit, no. So he's gonna go in and attack area 44. So let's take a quick look, see how that works out. The calculation is quite a bit simpler. It's a TEM four, that gives an offensive value of one. The defending unit is a three, so that's a defensive value of three. So in this example, we'll say the insurgent rolls a seven, that gives him an eight. The coalition player rolls an eight, that gives her an 11. Eight to 11, the insurgent player loses and the insurgent unit is eliminated. An important difference, though, between coalition and insurgent attacks is any time the insurgent attacks, the insurgent unit is always eliminated. Whether they win or lose the battle, they're eliminated. So that attack is done, had no effect. Okay, but there are still units there. So let's see what else the insurgent player can come up with. This time he says, I'm going to be a little bolder. I'm going to take my FEDAIN unit. I'm going to move into area 39 and attack. I see a very weak spent coalition unit there. So I'm gonna try my luck there. And I'm gonna do it with a FEDAIN unit. This is a tough decision because as I said, anytime you attack with an insurgent unit, it's eliminated in the combat. So since FEDAIN units are worth a victory point, I'm sacrificing one victory point if I do this. 
but it's a U.S. unit. If the U.S. unit loses the combat, it's going to be two casualty points, which are two victory points. So taking a chance. If the insurgent can win the battle, they'll be a net one victory point. If they lose the battle, they're a net one minus. So they're going to take their chances. If you do the calculation quickly for a three area, it's a zero. And since it's a Fed AIN unit, it's a plus one. So the offensive value for the insurgent is one. The coalition's defense factor is one. So it's even. They both have values of one. So it's whoever wins the dice roll. In this example, the insurgent player rolls a five. The coalition player rolls a nine. The coalition player wins the battle and the Fed AIN unit is eliminated. And at this point, the insurgent player is required to do what war gamers always do. They curse the dice and complain about their luck. Okay, but there are still units there. So the insurgent player still can do some things. So let's see what else he can do. Well, there's still a militia unit there. Let's try and attack with that one. We have one more attack. We didn't do very well in area 39. Let's go back to 44. So the militia unit moves in there. And when you resolve the combat, it's going to be the same calculation. It's going to be a one for the insurgent. It's going to be a three for the coalition defending. This time, the insurgent rolls a seven, coalition player rolls a three. So it's, a, it's eight to six and the insurgent player wins the battle. So this is two casualty points. And again, when the coalition takes casualties, there's no units eliminated or retreating or whatever. It's just, they are reflected as political points, which are victory points. So the militia units eliminated, but it did its job. It scored two victory points. And this time the coalition player complains about the dice and the cadre unit is left. Cadre units are too valuable. The insurgent player is done, has had enough attacks. They got their victory points and they're going to say, okay, I'll end my impulse. So with that, I'll end the examples. I would like to do one other thing now. And I think I, I hope I've given a pretty good overview of the game, but a lot of people are interested in playing solitaire. So I'll take just a couple minutes and talk about solitaire play. So first of all, the game, as I've described it, is a two player game, but it's certainly possible to play it solitaire. One very good way to play it solitaire is to do it old school, just play both sides. There's no hidden information in the game, so there isn't that to consider. And because of the variable turn length, it's you do not get into analysis paralysis. There's that tension. You can never, it's not like analyzing a chessboard where you can go infinitely deep into a variation. You, you don't really know how many impulses there are going to be, so you can't plan too far ahead. So it actually works quite well. And that's a very good way to play it. I can attest to that in the process of the design. I played it many, many, many times that way. But for people who'd like to actually have someone else to make the decisions for one of the sides, there is a bot that's included in the game as it's published in the magazine. And so if you play the coalition side, there's a bot that will handle the insurgents. Now, one of the things I wanted to do sometimes when you look at games that have solitaire modes, the, the rules actually change significantly to offset the fact that the bots are usually pretty dumb and don't play as well as a human player would. I tried to absolutely minimize that. So there's really only one rule change. So if you want to get started, there's about a page and a half to cover the solitaire game, but there's really only one paragraph that describes a rule change. And the only rule change is that when an insurgent reaction, when an insurgent retreats, it doesn't flip to spent. That's the only advantage that I give to the insurgent bot. Right now, I've put up an insurgent bot flowchart. If you look at the rest of the rule section covering the solitaire bot, it basically contains a couple of tables to help you determine how the bot reacts and also a number of processes and priorities for how it acts. And so you don't really have to read through all those rules and commit them to memory. What you can do is look at this chart and what this flowchart will do is if you look down the left side, you'll see that it lists points in the game where the insurgent needs to make a decision. And if you look at that point and say, for example, I'll look down here and say, insurgent units take casualty points. There's been a combat, the insurgent lost, they have to take casualty points. I look there and the arrow tells me, well, if I go to section 15, there'll be a little set there that tells me how to determine how the insurgent takes those casualty points. Maybe some of them will be as a retreat. Well, then I can go 
the arrow points as I go to section 16, and that'll determine where the insurgent retreats the units. So the human player playing solitaire does not have to make any decisions. Again, sometimes in solitaire games, people have kind of vague directions for the solitaire bot. This should be deterministic. If you don't want to make decisions for the insurgent side, the bot will always decide what has to be done. So the game should be a good solitaire experience. The experience is a little different, I'll admit. In two-player, it's much more of a competitive thing. I'm playing against a human opponent. I'm trying to outsmart and outmaneuver them. It's a little bit more like a role-playing experience in the solitaire version because you don't really know what you're going to encounter. And so it's a little bit more of the feeling of how, you know, what was it like coming into Fallujah back in November 2004. Okay, that's all I'll say about the solitaire module. Uh, I'll wrap up at this point and say, hey, if you've stuck with me this long, I appreciate your watching and listening. I hope you get a chance to play the game. If you do, if you have rules questions, I do monitor the forum on Consum World for Paper Wars. You're welcome to post questions there. There's also an entry on Board Game Geek, and I monitor that. So if you have any rules questions, please ask, and I'll try and get to them as quickly as I can. If you have any feedback posted, I'd be happy to hear that as well. So with that, I'll say, hey, I hope you get a chance to try the game. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you learn something about the battle from it. Thanks for watching and uh, have a good day.